It is April 4th, 2020. I am Ricky Berger, and this is the Keto Perspectives. I am joined by David Helper and Shihan, my sensei. Sensei, how are you? Good. Just don't forget I'm your sensei, so. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how I know, because you say that all the time. And I know. <laughs> Watching uh, Master, what's his name? Master. Which one? Oh, or Master something? Ken? Master huh? Ken? Master Ken, yeah, yeah. Bow to your sensei. <laughs> the big shout out to Master Ken out there. Yeah, Master Ken. That's fantastic. So this is uh, still season one, episode four, although we started this in 2016. So this is the longest season in the history of the world. Um, but a lot has happened since 2016. Today's episode is uh, entitled Applying Appropriate Mai in These Troubled Times, uh, Where is Our Dojo? And let's just talk about Kanai Sensei and be happy anyways. Right, Sensei? Yeah, I think that's it. We'll, we'll, we'll be serious and talk about what's going on for a short time and then, then let's have fun. That sounds, that sounds just um, great. So um, like many, 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 many other, if not all other dojos around the world uh, at this time, the dojo, our dojo, our beloved dojo is temporarily closed. Do you want to say a few words about what's happening with our members and, and us? Yeah. Um, well, uh, it just like everybody else that has a dojo. Um, this is, uh, like an unimaginable situation. And for everybody, whether you have a dojo or not, uh, no, I think everybody's still trying to figure out exactly what's going on. But, um, you know, Aikido being something that requires close contact, uh, it uh, fits squarely in the zone of things we cannot do physically. Um, and so what we've been doing is trying to develop a program of online content um, and create online uh, events where people can come together and learn something about Aikido and have some fun also. Um, and uh, like it is at the dojo, you know, when you're at the dojo, part of it is seriously studying Aikido and part of it is just a partaking of the nice little community that tends to grow up around dojos. Right. And having sort of a good time with, with all of us. Um, right. So one of the things that, you know, from my perspective that's happened, which is uh, magical really is sensei that you've kept the community together um, in order to figure out how to keep the community together. And in doing that, we all cling to each other and figure out how do we do online classes? How do we keep connected? How do we talk about um, Aikido? How do we, train um although we have to have this distance and it's been really great because it's so easy to get lonely um because of what's happening and the news is awful and in the midst of it we're finding some joy with each other and um that's led by you sensei so thank you well, you know, uh, the thing about a dojo is a, you know, a dojo is a team sport. And the dojo, the community of people in the dojo, they're all like key players in this thing. And uh, one good thing about our dojo uh, is that people have always shown up when we needed something done, like to make the move or to um, – uh, deal with the seminar last year, a big seminar. Um, and what's happened now is that a team of people, a group of people has come together to help produce this, um, this online content. And it's cer certainly something I'm not an expert in. And uh, fortunately we have some people that are, have really great skills in this area, but we're just starting from zero and trying to figure out what should an online dojo be in light of the fact that we can't be physically together and yeah it's, it's really cool um and uh, oh we forgot to sing our our theme song um when we started the uh, podcast uh, do you know why no uh, because we don't have one so oh, oh that's right yeah big shout out to uh chris niskola uh <laughs> who is uh who's going to be composing the 
a specific theme music for Aikido Perspectives. And uh, any, you, you, do you have any other message for Chris, uh, Sensei? Yeah, why haven't you done it yet? <laughs> Thank you, Sensei. <laughs> Step it up here. This air is, I can't wait. (laughs) (laughs) Um, So we've been doing things that are so cool. Like we have an advisory council that meets uh, in Zoom uh, every week to talk about everything that's going on. We also have started a, um, a cocktail hour on Friday evenings where the first hour is family friendly and um, um, following which um, I can't describe what happens, but uh, it's just wonderful to have community. And, and, uh, and today we had an online class by one of the senior students, which I took in my backyard, which was so much fun. It's just so great. It's great. And uh, I hope that we're going to have more and more things like that. Um, but uh, th- those are two, th- that's some of the things we're doing. And then we've, we've also had uh, video review sessions where we all get on a, a Zoom uh, meeting and we look at videos together. And um, yeah, yeah, those are excellent. Yeah, you've been leading those. Um, what have we had? We've had two of them, right? Looking at Kanai Sensei, uh, Joe Kata. Yeah, Kanai Sensei, Joe Kata. We looked at Kanai Sensei doing fifth Q techniques, and we looked at some things that, and that's those are in the department of actually doing work and and learning something specific. But we also have some fun by watching different Aikido videos that I think are really cool. Such yeah, as yeah. uh, Kai Sensei's freestyle from the '84 demonstration, and um, uh, a, a very old film of Kai Sensei uh, in Japan before he came, uh, which is part of uh, the technical Aikido video. That was the 1962 clip, right? Right. That's correct. That, that was excellent. That was excellent. Oh, um, uh, let me take this opportunity to. Uh, apologize for what well, when we started these podcasts it was 2016 and I was probably a, a fifth Q and um, and I've gotten a lot of feedback on something I did terribly wrong which was that I was not referring to Kanai Sensei as Kanai Sensei I was referring to him in another way that was inappropriate so I want to take this opportunity uh, uh, to apologize and to the extent to which anyone else continues to need to chastise me please do <laughs> is that okay well, Sensei I will continue to chastise you. However, um, again, this is a this is a point of etiquette, and not everybody follows this particular rule. And but in the world I live in, uh, you you would not refer to him as Kanai. It would be Kanai Sensei. And but uh, uh, some other people don't follow that rule, or I guess some other people are supposed to follow that rule or don't. So there's different categories of people. But with etiquette, you just have to always keep in mind it's somewhat uh, specific to uh, your dojo or your line or or your organization, um, and not everybody shares it. So, Um, But to me, like, I could never call him Kanai. I just couldn't. Or for that matter, any of those teachers, Shiba Sensei and, you know, Tamar Sensei, Toei Sensei, et cetera. Uh, Sugano Sensei, I just couldn't. I, I personally, it just wouldn't come out. Uh, did you call any them, other way? Did you call all of them Sensei? Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah, so it's confusing sorry, when you start. Like, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I I said this confusing when you start. I remember when I was a beginner being really confused. Like, do you just call them all Sensei, or do you <laughs> have, to have different names for each one, or what do you do? I remember this. It's like, I don't know what I'm doing. But ultimately, you called each of them sensei if you were with them, right? Correct. Okay. And if I was with several of them, in, like in the same room, I would still call them all sensei, which led to some confusion, I'm sure. Oh, so if you were in the same room with two of them, you wouldn't call one of them their name sensei and then the other their name sensei? No, if- I wouldn't. No. Uh, oh. Oh, this is good to know. Yeah. I mean, again, I think with etiquette, there's different approaches and different and so forth, but that's the way I did it. That's, that's the way I thought it should be done from what I could gather from 
you know, when you're, when you're with those guys, it's really funny, funny thing, because, uh, uh, especially when a bunch of them are together, it's really like, it's it like buzzes and it's really hard to relax because you're sort of, sort of, you have to pay attention to all of them in case somebody needs something or, you know, yep. so, and, and so, uh, and then you're calling them all sensei and it's very confusing, but it, it it's, was when I started, of course, it was Kanai sensei and that's who we called sensei. And that was very straightforward. But then when, other of the of the, those that that group of teachers and other higher ranking teachers would come, then we're calling them sensei too. Then we all got, or I got very confused, and uh, and when you're with them and there were more than one, it was particularly confusing. That's interesting. That is really interesting. Yeah, I've kind of been there. I, I, I spend my life a little confused about all of this in keto, which is great actually. I try to work through all this stuff. Um, so. We're, we're out here, we're trying to um, still uh, advance in Aikido, but also deal with what we're dealing with um, in this environment. Uh, is there anything else that you want to add about where we're at? I mean, we've looked at other dojos and we're trying to live our life and try to stay safe. Is there anything else you want to add um, about what's happening and with Aikido? Uh, I guess I guess two points. One would be uh, certainly I'm spending a lot more time reading things and looking at videos than I normally would, especially reading things uh, as opposed to just practicing where my focus usually is. And so I th I think that's really very valuable, and it's it's good to have the time, little time to do that. And secondly, in terms of the dojo, I, I just am you know, so amazed at the students in the dojo and how they're dealing with this and, and supporting the dojo and, and creating that kind of interaction. And it, it's really, uh, you know, I, uh, I hope all dojos can, can find that. And I think people are probably getting to know each other in different ways as well. Oh, that's awesome. I mean, I feel blessed by everyone that's, uh, I feel blessed by you, by Barbara Sensei, by everyone in the dojo and to just be quote unquote a part of um, the experience. It's just so, it's so cool in such a time that's so, so scary. Yeah, I think Aikido is supposed to be sort of a pillar uh, or a bedrock or something. And no matter what happens, it's still there and it's not changing, although it's changing all the time, but it's always there and uh, it doesn't matter what's going on in the rest of the world. You can always go to that place. That is, that, that just describes the whole sort of Tao of it all. <laughs> that it's, you know, changing, you know, but it's it, not changing, but it's all changing and it's everywhere. Yeah. Well, you know, uh, the idea I got was that uh, martial arts is supposed to be uh, impeccably practical. And so what that means is when you, ha when you suffer adversity or in a bad or had a bad outcome or you're in a bad situation, uh, you know, think you basically, you have to dredge out of that things you can use. So, Whatever bad happens, you still have to, you had a unit of time where that was happening. You have to extract from that every piece of knowledge you can and apply it to how you do things and how you're going to do things going forward. So uh, I don't know if that's clear, but it's just no matter what happens, martial arts is about practicality and you extract from it the information you can and you apply it going forward. So in other words, it's all a lesson. It's all a lesson. Is that right? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. Uh, it's, 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 see, I wouldn't put it, it's a lesson. Although I know, like, that's a very common, that's a very, you know, normal way to put it. Okay. But I'm, I'm, uh, in this thing, which I kind of got from Kanai Sensei also, this process of being very practical that's a process. It's not a concept. You know what I mean? Yes, I do. I'm not, I'm not calling it a lesson, although it is. But I'm coming at it by saying it's the process that I'm engaged in, in processing whatever it is that's going on. 
Okay, hold on. So I may have had an epiphany, which is, you know, me, this is like Dawn over Marblehead because it takes a lot for me to learn anything. But when I say it's a lesson, that's kind of static. When you say it's a process, it's that it, this is just, this just keeps going. Yeah, you just keep, you just keep extracting information from everything and using it. You got to use it to improve whatever. Wow. Um, yeah, it's cool. And that way, you know, at that, at that level, of course, it's hard to do it, but you're, it doesn't matter what's happening on the outside. It's just about you and what's happening inside of you. Wow. So as a segue, uh, l- let me suggest this. You and I had uh, looked at an article about Kanai Sensei that came out in uh, this week in a keto journal. Uh, which was excerpts from an interview by Stanley Pranan, Pranan. Um, Pranan um, from August 22nd, 1979 at the New England summer camp. And we thought we would talk about some of the things that Kanai Sensei had said uh, and just sort of, you know, bat that a, a, around a bit is, uh, would you like to do that now? Yeah, let's do that. Cause we talked about this other stuff enough. Yeah. Yeah. Let's bring it up. Yeah. Let's, let's get some joy. Let's talk about Kanai Sensei. So, well, just to set the scene. So this, this took place in 19, the summer camp of uh, 1979, which was at Governor Dummer Academy. No, no, it was at Hampshire College. That was the year it moved to Hampshire College. Oh, okay. Yeah. And that was um, uh, a 10 day camp in two sessions. And Saito Sensei came the first session and Tamara Sensei came the second session of memory serves. And Stanley was in uh, Saito Sensei's uh, group. So he came, uh, Stanley Prannon and Bruce Clickstein. Uh, and, oh, and Matthew, um, I'm blanking on his name. He's now in New York. Very good guy. Um, uh, Bender, uh, I got to look it up. He, 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 Recently has practiced at New York Aikikai. For, very good guy. Anyway, the three of them were, so Bruce, Stanley, yeah, and Matthew, I think, had come with Saito Sensei. So that's, that's the summer camp at which this took place, and that's why uh, Stanley was there and why Sensei was there. Okay. And um, I'm sure you have vivid memories of that summer camp. Yeah, yeah, I do. <laughs> I do. I remember Kido Sensei was very scary. <laughs> really? Really? <laughs> uh, but I thought they were all scary. Wow. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so that was, that was it. So this is a very interesting interview. It's, uh, I believe it's uh, available if you go to Aikido Journal website uh, and go into their interview section. I think you can find this interview if you want to. Um, And uh, it was good because uh, Stanley really did some incredible work interviewing many, many uh, teachers and Aikido practitioners and uh, of the, and especially the older generation and they're, they're not around anywhere. So if he hadn't done that, we would, we would not have anything like that. Um, and um, so uh, he, had a, he had a methodology and it was really coming at Sensei from the point of view of an outside person. Not that I knew that at that time because I had only been at New England Nike Kai for a couple of years, I guess, at that point. Oh, really? Yeah. Do you, do you remember what your rank was? Is that even important? Uh, I don't know. Uh, let me see. Um, is that an appropriate like question to ask you? Fourth Q or something, something like that. Wow. <laughs> um, so, um, yeah, so that was kind of an interesting interview. And uh, it also caught Sensei at a very, at a relatively early stage, whereas we did other interviews with Sensei later on, but they tended to be in, much later. So this is really an interesting interview. Oh, that's cool. So I, I had gone through this. I, I, had gone through this and there were some portions of it that I thought were um, really interesting or stunning. And I had brought that up to you and you said, Hey, so let's talk about it. So if, if you would like, I can take a passage, read it, and then read some of what can I sensei said, and then um, 
you know, ask you to explain. Is, okay. Does that make sense? I can. <laughs> cool. Okay. Cool. Let's do it. So uh, this is one of Stanley's questions. I've been studying the life of Osensei and the history of Aikido. As a result, some of the points that had previously given me trouble have slowly cleared up. Do you think that probably most of the present teachers actually received only a little direct teaching from Osensei? The reason for this being that for 15 years after the war, he lived in Iwama and visited other dojos for only very short period of times. I wonder if a proportion of the teachers didn't have that much opportunity to learn the sword and stick. Okay, and I, so and here's the background this okay saito sensei was in iwama and that was where o sensei spent a lot of time and then kanai sensei and all the uchideshi were in hambu dojo in tokyo and uh stanley's point of view i think was that he believed that a lot of teachers received only a little direct teaching from o sensei i.e all the people at hambu dojo uh, and it was, it was only at Iwama that the people really uh, got direct teaching. And also there was a thing uh, where Iwama always did a lot of weapons, but Hambu Dojo, they, they always did very little weapons if, or none. And so the, the Iwama school, uh, I think, developed the belief that they were the only ones that learned weapons from Osensei. So that's sort of like a loaded question. So it's a loaded question. It is. It's a loaded question. Yes. Well, can I say as part of his answer said, different people have different image of the founder. And I don't think that anyone can say that that man's image is wrong. And this person's idea is mistaken. Well, I, the part that I, that, you know, bears on the point, the, the loaded question issue, I guess we shouldn't be saying this, but um, is the first part where he says, this, so Stanley says the proportion of teachers didn't have much opportunity to learn the sword and stick, i.e. they didn't really get any direct teaching. Right. Uh, so Sensei says, I suppose one could say that, but in my own case, when I entered as an Uchideshi circa 1958, O Sensei divided his time equally between Iwama and the Hambu Dojo. For that reason, I don't think that anyone can say that Hambu people didn't learn much directly from O Sensei. Yeah, exactly. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. So he's, he's, uh, he's uh, directly addressing the premise of the question. Oh yeah, you're right. Or the, 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 the subtext of the question. You know, and um, I don't know what the first question was in the actual interview, but in the printed interview from Aikido Journal, that's the first question. Right. So I, I just wonder, uh, what can I sensei might have thought about? Okay, here we go. This is the first question. Where are we going from there? Uh, yeah, well, this was this was one of the issues that was floating around in the Aikido uh, atmosphere or stratosphere at this time, and it was and it went on for a long time. It was the whole Iwama versus Hambu Dojo thing, and right, and part of it was that at Hambu for and I'm not even sure exactly why this is the case. They do very little weapons. And, um, but <laughs> they're, they're not, you know, plenty of Osensei students who were those Uchideshi that were basically in at Hambu, they learned weapons somehow. So, uh, but at, so the, the image was the only, only the Iwama people know how to do weapons. Oh, or, or that was the, that was what was being presented. I would say. Oh, You're exaggerating a little bit. No, no, but I understand though. Um, Wow, that's interesting. So there was uh, almost like a competition about this or a sort of a... The, yeah, uh, maybe, maybe something like that. A little, I think, there was, I think there was a little bit of friction between Saito Sensei and Hambu Dojo and Doshu. And, uh, but I think uh, they handled it in a very Japanese way. Uh, of, it was never stated, I don't think, by... Well, maybe Saito Sensei stated a little bit, but... Yeah, and this is 1979, and Osensei had passed in 1969. Right. So, okay, that makes sense. Um, so the next question... Oh, so then, sorry, oh, go on. So then he says, Sensei says, it's simply a matter of each person taking from within Osensei's technique that which he could grasp, and the resulting differences are another problem. Isn't it unfortunate that the number of such people is so small? Um, 
I'm sure that those who have grasped it really have something. But of course, different people have a different image of the founder. And I don't think anyone can say that that man's image is wrong and this person's idea is mistaken. So what do you take from that? Um, I think that uh, for some reason uh, at Hambu, they took uh, more of the uh, taijutsu part and at Iwama, they took more of the weapons part. And, but it, there was probably a lot of variation in the individuals within each of those groups. Well, at least at Hambu, I would say. Um, and um, the, the differences that you observe I think he's saying the differences you observe between people is not because, for example, they didn't have any teaching from O-sensei, but that people inevitably have to translate what O-sensei was doing, which was hard to grasp into their own terms and through their own bodies. And so there was an inevitable variation in the way people practiced and the way they, uh, the image they had of Aikido or the ideas they had about Aikido. How does style emerge from that? Well, that's style. That's what style is. And, right. and so then you say, even today, you say Iwama style. People who, who are in the Saito Sensei's line, their way of doing Aikido is very distinct. As soon as you see someone, if they're a student in Saito Sensei's line, it's immediately recognizable. Hmm, interesting. And that's style. And uh, Kanai Sensei had a style. All of those guys had a style. Um, and it's because I think it's because just inevitably you, well, one part of it is that no matter what it was, everybody would have to, you have to retranslate all of the Aikido through yourself. And so everybody individually is different from everybody else, no matter how much they're trying to copy exactly. Okay. So that's teacher. the thing. What sensei, what does that mean as a, as a student, as a student of yours or of any other sensei? As the student tries to rise up and become proficient, what does that mean to us? How should we be thinking? <laughs> Damn if I know. <laughs> <laughs> and that's a keto perspective. <laughs> <laughs> See you next time. <laughs> <laughs> we will answer no further questions. <laughs> um, yeah, that's... Yeah. When you were developing into what became uh, your style, but celebrating what you learned from Kanai Sensei, what was that like for you? Does that make sense? Does that question make sense? You mean like, how did I experience being a student of Kanai Sensei? And end up arriving at the style that is you. Oh. Well, early in your Aikido career, you, you arrive at the style that is you because you're making all these mistakes. <laughs> okay, yep. Um, and then I think you're, you're always in the, in the state of noticing your mistakes and, and, and trying to identify things that you're doing that you need to do more correctly. I don't think that ever ends. Um, and... Um, I think when you're more junior, I don't know. Well, let me not put it that way, but I have found that, I mean, I don't think I thought about it until I was, I don't know, uh, you know, 20, 30 years into practicing that I started noticing that I did have my own idiosyncratic ways of doing things um, or that, um, uh, I was adapting in some way the movements that would somehow fit me. And I sort of became self-conscious of it a little bit. Wow. 20, 30 years, I, I would never think of that. I was just trying to copy whatever I saw. Not, maybe it was the same process, but I was just viewing it differently. But, and then also, Kanai Sensei died, right? Right. So Kanai Sensei died in 2004. And then at that point, some people just take another teacher, but you know, we, many of us didn't feel that way. So our teacher was gone. Right. So then what do you do? So then you have to, so I think then the process becomes you try to, uh, uh, you study 
what you learned uh, as precisely as you can and try to crystallize it a little bit because now you're a teacher without a teacher, but you still have students. So maybe it's, maybe it's about that. Sensei dies and then a lot of the things, Sensei was always changing in his Aikido. He was always, I always had the image of him that he was a artist or some kind of artist that goes to his studio every day and does his art. Right. And he's always working it, always working at it. And it would change, it would evolve. And so then when he's gone and then I started thinking about, well, what are the things that he would have reached in his evolution if he was alive? Not that I can really do that, but I try to extrapolate forward a little bit. And also part of it is just experience where you try to do something he did and you say, wait a minute, there's something wrong with that. Or sometimes somebody asks a question that brings up something. Wow, I never thought of that part. Um, and so you're grappling with, with new realizations about uh, aspects of some movement. So are you still working the process um, that you learned from Kanai Sensei as uh, the path continues? Is that what it is? Maybe, you know, I never thought of it that way, but maybe it is because his teaching method was very much getting you to internalize a process. So he did not instruct verbally very much. Um, and um, as he got older, he, and he started writing his book, he did more. Or he would have times like at a seminar when he would just talk a lot and explain a lot, but basically not that, that much. And then, so he would demonstrate a technique like four times and let's go say practice. And then while the class was on, you'd be practicing and he would come over and stand next to you. And he had this particular pose he would often get into with his hand, legs really spreading his hands on his knee. So he's like really like, like an empire, like a, like baseball, a baseball ump, right? And he'd, he'd watch you. <laughs> and sometimes he would give you a correction, but most times, I don't know, I can't, I don't know how, what would the proportion was, but sometimes he would give you a correction and sometimes he wouldn't, he would walk away. And so while he was there watching you, you were thinking, <laughs> am I doing it right? You know, <laughs> or am I doing, you know, and then he looks at, he watches you and then he walks away and then you're thinking, well, was I doing it right? Was I doing it wrong? And you start thinking about the things that you might have done wrong, basically. Well, okay. But somehow the th you're trying to identify errors and eliminate them. But inside the silence of those moments, he's instilling a deeper idea about the process that you should be going through, even when he's not looking at you. I, I, think, that's, I think that's what was going on. That's but cool. That's also I amazing. I don't know if he... Cool. I don't know if he consciously intended that or uh -huh. um, uh, did not or um, what, but that's, that was the experience of it. And so I think that those of us who were serious students of his got in that mode of very continual self-examination and analysis, not only of what you're doing, but Aikido and how things, how Aikido is supposed to work. And you're always saying, well, was I doing it right? Was I doing it wrong? What part was right? What part was wrong? Hmm. What, what, what should I do next? You know, how do I, how do I make it better? Wow. And, and sort of as a life lesson, that's just a good thing to, it, with, with whatever you're doing. Am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? What's the little detail should I be working on? Um, also, should I not be, I shouldn't be upset at myself. I just be working this thing, right? Just like trying to get a little better every moment. Does that make sense? Sensei, did I lose you? Sorry, I accidentally put on the mute. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, where were we? Something so truly offensive, you left. <laughs> yeah. 
Sorry about that. So, you know, what I said was, so the process, the process from sort of a life perspective is you don't get upset about yourself. You just are constantly looking at, am I doing it right? Am I doing it wrong? What little details should I work on? And let's just move forward, you know, on the path. And just keep practicing. And keep practicing. So. I, yeah, that's what I, that's, that's what I got out of it. <sighs> that's cool. So Stanley had asked, uh, can I sensei, uh, what did O Sensei, you know, talk about and how did he explain what he was doing and how did you get it, basically, was that question. And Kanai Sensei said um, that O Sensei wasn't really technical in his explanations. He would throw Ushideshi uh, with very little by way of explanation and we would grasp what we could of the feeling of the techniques while we were flying through the air. Yeah, exactly. And I think that's really interesting. Um, so uh, Stanley was, asked, was sort of recounting how O-sensei went through a lot of different periods. And he said, according to Saito-sensei, it was in the post-war period that O-sensei gradually systemized his technique. Um, then right. in his later life, his technique became more abstract. Uh, but he, his explanation was in terms of the Kamisama, the gods, the Shinto gods, and he very rarely talked of technical matters. And uh, Kanai Sensei told me the same thing. I think, I think the systemization of the technique, even maybe uh, as we know it, happened after by Doshu. Um, uh, I'm, I'm not even sure uh, how far O Sensei got, but it's definitely true that it was gradually systematizing. And I, I think that's when they started giving things names like Ikkyo and stuff like that. Um, but Kanai Sensei said, yeah, he. He, I, I asked him about that, and he said, no, he never ex explained anything technical. And he would just say, um, uh, and I forget now, I can't, I can't remember if Kanai Sensei told me this or Karita Sensei told me this, but if you asked O Sensei a question, he would say, grab my wrist. No, really? And then he would throw you. <laughs> and then, and that was it. And that was your technical thing. So, so Kanai Sensei said, uh, what he say? Um, yeah, so he says, well, what did O-sensei talk about? And, and Kanai-sensei agrees. Uh, it, Stanley says, what were they general matters or did he speak in details? And Kanai-sensei says, well, they were not what we would call technical matters. He would I, throw the uchideshi with very little in the way of explanation. And we would grasp what we could by the feeling of the technique while we were flying through the air. Yeah, and then he said... We were Budo people, so that's the way it should be. Yeah, we were Budo people, so I think that's the way it should be. Without trying to keep everything very rigid in our minds, like one plus one is two, we learned and progressed on our own by being thrown by the master and feeling his technique. Then we'd throw our partner with that same feeling. That's how it should be, I think. <sighs> So I love that in that it talks about sort of finding the feeling without rigidity in your minds. But that being said, uh, you know, in my own study of Aikido as a beginner, uh, I can't be thrown by you and your power. And I can't be thrown by senior students at their um, power. And I spend a lot of time figuring out what one plus one is because that's all I'm able to do. Um, Am I doing it wrong? <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, Sensei. You're definitely doing it wrong, but that may not be your mistake. <laughs> that, was, uh, that was too easy. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. You're giving me these, uh, you're throwing yeah, me these. Uh, like a tea balls. <laughs> meatballs down the middle. Yeah, exactly. Um, so. Um, what do you do? Well, well, one thing is, is that, see, I think it's important to know where you are in Aikido history. So when O Sensei was around in he that's how he was. But and that's how they all and they all were sort of bought into that system, which was I think the old Japanese martial arts system where there's no talking. And I think that was traditional in right. Japanese martial arts. And you just try to catch that feeling or you try to you well, you try to copy it. You try to copy it physically. But you, 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 you kind of go a lot off the feeling because you don't have that component of that intellectual component of, okay, we're going to call this technique this. And uh, this technique basically is like this. 
and uh, in order to be in a good position, you have to be here. And when you throw in order to be to generate power correctly, you have to be in this position. So that's very intellectual. And I think that later, in a later phase of Aikido, which I think is more the phase that we're still in, it's a continuation of the systemization. Okay. And I think that's, uh, but it always, it's always both. And that's why it's so important to have a teacher and be thrown by the teacher. And it's not, it's not how good your kemi is. It's, it's just catching something every time somebody throws you as much as you can. And by catching it, their power, um, you get the feeling of their technique and you just do it as, as best as you can at whatever stage you're at. I, I mean, in my relationship with you, that's exactly what I try to do. Um, and I generally walk away um, disappointed in myself, but still trying to find the connection and to take, to take the ride. That's how I look at it in my mind. I want to take yeah, the ride. I think that's right. But don't be so disappointed, you know, because uh, everything else is correct. So just reduce the, reduce the amount of disappointment is in the recipe. That makes sense. <laughs> Thank you, Sensei. That that makes sense. Um, so, I want to push on to something else that I don't even know how to discuss. So I'm just going to put it in front of you. It, it, this is from the interview. Uh, Stanley talks about uh, Oh Sensei in his later years being looked at as kind of a very kind little old man, right. uh, as opposed to being very you know vigorous uh, in 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 his youth and. Um, he asked Kanai Sensei, do you think it's important to study the teachings of Osensei as a younger man in his 50s and 60s? And um, Kanai Sensei says, yes, but towards the end of that answer, he says something that I think is to, was very moving for me, but I don't completely understand it. He says, at any rate, if Akito is Budo, then as such, when we talk about Shikaku, when we can enter the blind spot, oh, or when we are perfect in terms of technique, then I think it's necessary to display over and above these things, the softness and beauty of harmoniously encountering your partner. I think that the, be the beauty of Budo is the beauty that comes from an effective and really efficient and rational control of the partner or adversary. Um, would you like to speak to that? Because I would love to hear your thoughts on that. Well, Let's see. So, um, so at the beginning, he says, certainly the techniques of O-Sensei later in his life look extremely soft. Uh, but if people only see only the pliability and seek after that alone, then I think that we can say that Aikido ends up looking like some kind of dance. And I think that he was, I, I think at that point, uh, it, so this is 1979, um, I think that I think that maybe in Japan, but certainly in the United States, the part of Aikido that was very soft and pliable uh, was emphasized. In part, I, I think it had to do with uh, people wanting to make it distinct from other martial arts, um, and and part of it was that people had uh, intellectual or philosophical ideas about harmony. Uh, and, and so I think he thought that, uh, in the Aikido world, he looked at it and people were, were, were only seeing that part of it, that part of the Aikido. And then, so he says, so, so as a, in that line, then I, th okay, if people only see the pliability and seek after that alone, we, then I think we can say Aikido looks up, ends up looking like some kind of dance, which is a lot of people, how a lot of people see Aikido. Right. So then he goes on and he says, but, yeah. if, but if a person who, who can really see looks, I think he will realize that even the smallest movement O-sensei had, the power that comes, oh, that even in the smallest movement O-sensei did, he had the power that comes from training in real Budo. That's, and what he meant by that was the hard parts of Aikido. Okay, right. So, 
it, it, placing him in time. And I think when he wrote Technical Aikido, it was in part a response to him, him looking out and seeing that it had gotten too soft or emphasizing the, uh, the, the pliable part out of it, of Aikido too much, or was just focusing on that. Um, and he was trying to rede- redress the balance, but not to eliminate the, the, the pliability and the softness, but because that's a technique that le- eventually ends in rational control of the partner or adversary. So I, his concept of, of what Aikido was, and it's, he says it explicitly in technical Aikido, has to have both, at least both of these things, if not a bunch of other things. And you have to have the right proportion of each. So I think in that period, you know, I, 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 in that period, I think the soft part had, was, the pendulum had swung to the soft part. But that's fascinating because on the one hand, Kanai Sensei's techniques are beautiful looking. And he explicitly says that Aikido should be beautiful. He said that many times. Aikido, when you look at it, it's beautiful. And he said the reason it's beautiful is because it's so uh, efficient and practical. And the beauty comes out of this rationality. Okay, so with that said, and please don't be offended if this is an offensive question, I'm just going to ask it directly. Sensei, did Kanai Sensei throw hard? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but he threw really hard, but it never felt bad. It, it always felt what like... What does that mean? Because it had the right combination of power and pliability. Wow. So, um, and, um, I think he was, he was not dismissing the the soft part by any means, but he wanted to understand how the soft part and the hard part that is really what makes it a, a martial art as opposed to a dance, how they needed to be combined and, and the correct combination of those things was the real Aikido. That's awesome. That's okay. And and I'm not. I, I I'm in a way. I'm just paraphrasing things that he wrote and said. I, I I'm. This is not. I, I I'm modifying a little bit, but he basically said as much. So, um, Sensei, is this how you look at it with respect to your keto? Yeah. No, I totally think that's right. I think I think that's the right concept. In other words. Uh, you're, tr- you're trying to be able to totally control someone's movement very uh, soft, very easily. And, and so the opponent never feels like he's being mauled or, or oppressed or he never feels anything hard. It's like, it's like the opponent is like, Happy, 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 dead. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I, I, I'm, you know, I'm being funny, obviously. Not, 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 not that I haven't heard this on the mat from you, but yes, I get it. <laughs> but, so, and the reason, the, and, and if the opponent feels that, then they feel good, but you're totally in control of their movement. And then you can generate power and of course you're practicing you're trying to deploy as much power as you can subject to the uh ukemi of the of your partner but if you don't enter as a brute um which are beginners like myself uh when we get all worked up tend to do your partner or your opponent's not worried as you gently lead them and they feel comfortable until they don't right and then it's too late so hard to by the learn. time they start feeling bad, it's too late. It's all over. But uh, in terms of practice, uh, Kanai Sensei was uh, stressed uh, not, and not just Kanai Sensei, everybody does, uh, not clashing when you enter. So in other words, if the opponent's coming at you and you're going at them, it's very easy to have a collision. Right. If you have a collision, then 
you, you could lose your balance as much as the opponent might. It's like one of those 50, 50 things that is the not is the anti martial arts paradigm. Right. Um, so can I sense this very into how you, how you turn your body at the moment of, you know, at the moment of, of uh, at the first part when you enter in order not to have a collision. So that's an example of how you're soft. That's why Aikido is so hard. That's, Part of the reason why Aikido is so and so different than uh, other some other martial arts, I think so. I don't have that much experience with other martial arts, but I do hear people discussing: Is Aikido hard or soft? Well, Aikido is both hard and soft, right? So when people are like talking that, like, is it hard or soft? I I'm a bit quizzical, but uh, there's a lot of things about Aikido that are not binary, also. You know, they're not like this. It, Aikido is not this or that. <laughs> yeah. And um, so uh, anyway, so I think what Kanai Sensei is saying here is that um, you are both hard and soft, and it depends on exactly the part of a technique or exactly what's going on. And also, and so it's, it's completely efficient. So that you're not struggling, uh, and the UK is kind of you know going with you or feeling okay, and then rational control. That means rational control means you're not necessarily going to kill someone, right? You're going to use, like he said, uh, the totality of your wisdom in order to decide what the outcome of the situation should be. Yeah, and inside of this uh, situation that can be chaotic, you're calm. I mean, that's you're supposed to be, yeah. That's the keto way, right? Yeah, you're supposed to be completely calm through the whole thing. Wow. Uh, and so, that's you train for that, right? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Theoretically, so, hopefully I'm getting there. Yeah, I get it. Um, so he's trying to, he's trying to say, I, th- I would say, what he's trying to say Aikido is a true Budo. And, and because it's a true Budo, it has both hard and soft elements uh, based on what is most efficient. Yes. Yes. And it's a lot more efficient if the opponent is not resisting you. Because you can lead them. Right. Yeah. You can do more things to them. They're not resisting. Yep. For one reason or another. I wonder if that's the answer that Stanley thought would come from that question. I, I doubt it. Uh, yeah, when you look at the whole interview, it's it's really interesting. Look, here's the questions, and then here's what Kanai Sensei chooses to talk about in the answers. Right, right. Yeah, because I, I think Stanley was coming at it from a very different perspective than Sensei was. Yeah. And uh, well, Stanley asked this the, the, this le- this next one. I loved this one. Um, Stanley asked Kanai Sensei, for example, this is the end of a question. Did you have trouble with Yukemi when you first started? Was there a time when the techniques were difficult for you? Um, I loved his answer to that. Um, So he says, well, yes. At first, I couldn't take Ukemi very well. I had done judo, and so I had enough confidence in judo Ukemi. But when someone like Tamara Senpai, Tamara Sensei now, or was, got a hold of me, I always bumped my head on the mats, and there didn't seem to be anything I could do about it. Judo Kemi, in a certain respect, didn't seem to be of much help. And also, when I, because I tried to understand Aikido in terms of Judo, I wasted a lot of time before I began to do anything that could be called real Aikido. Everything I did, every move, was from a Judo point of view, and this was something that I couldn't get away from for a long time. That was amazing for me to read that. Well... Yeah, I mean, I think that's that's right. You, that's really how you're supposed to. That's actually how I learned to take a break fall. Tell me more. When I first started at New England Aikikai, Kai, uh, guys were throwing me like just banging my head on the ground, shionage especially. And one day I somehow took a break fall when they did that. Like, I, I, I don't think I. I knew what I was doing exactly, but it, there was something about, they were throwing me and somehow I took a break fall and I realized that was much better. 
Oh. They weren't banging my head on the ground. <laughs> and I think that's how I took my first break fall. And it was, it was, it was the same scenario there. I was having my head banged on. Them. That's why I really relate to this, you know, which is really, I don't mean to talk about me, but no, this is good. This is good. So he told that story. I had that experience in his dojo. So, but, and I thought that was really an interesting way of learning in Ukemi. Um, of course, later than we, we learned it. But at that time, I don't think Ukemi was really taught very much. It was more like, you know, you figure it out. You're, they're going to, and people were really rough in those days, you know. Well, your friends who were banging you against the mat on Shuhanagi, et cetera, um, were you scared of them? They weren't my friends. Ah. They were, they were like the senior students. <laughs> ah. Okay. okay. I was hoping they were my friends. <laughs> I have a friend of the dojo who I will not name, who always, um, my head always bangs against the mat when he throws me. And, um, uh, and I love him dearly. And I just want to get just better when he throws me. He's my friend though. Um, but I know I'm not doing it right. Cause every time he gets a hold of me, it's my head in the mat. Yeah. I mean, like, I think when you have something like that, you just, you have to keep working on your chemi, keep practicing your chemi and then keep studying exactly what's happening. Mm. because there's always, there's always certain people that throw you in a way that's like hurts, you know, or something like that. It's like no matter how long you practice, no matter how good your chemi is, there's always people that can hurt you. <laughs> <laughs> so, this is not encouraging. <laughs> but, but the number of people that can hurt you start, declines very, you know, after you oh. practice for a long time. Oh, okay. There's not that many of them anymore. <laughs> I have lots of them. <laughs> when, you, when you start, everybody's hurting you, right? Yeah, yeah. As someone there's once said, less you're hurting me in every way possible. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot less of them now for me, actually. It's true, even though I'm still a beginner. That's true. I never thought of that. Because you're always like in some position relative to your senpai and your kohai. And, uh, oh, that makes sense. You know, that never changes either. It's just that, you know, if you practice decades, you know, there's, you have more kohai than senpai, but there's still plenty of senpai. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, you're always in that situation. But, that, that's, but it's that's true. As, as, as you go, you know, if you're, as your chemi improves, you know, you're able to absorb much more things from, of all different kinds. The other thing about this answer from Kanai Sensei is that notion that Zen notion of emptying your cup that you can't walk. Like he's talking about walking into the dojo and in, in thinking from the perspective of judo, which he says held him back. And um, I can relate to that from other things that I practice, which have held me back in the keto because I keep looking at another perspective. I'm like, no, you have to stop doing that. It's not going to help you. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think it's difficult for people to come to Aikido from other martial arts because I, I, I gather from the people that do that uh, that it's really different. And um, uh, so, yeah, I think that's true. And Aikido is, I think, a, a unique thing. And the method of practice in Aikido is like, I think it's genius. Just what if O Sensei created that? I mean, that was that's really a a genius creation. And and if I understand that correctly, it's the concept that here's a process in, under which you can practice the techniques full out, full power, not kill the other guy, and everybody gets something great out of it, and you can do it over and over again. Yeah, that, not even not kill them, but not hurt them. Right. And that's, that's the thing. Yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, that's, that's one of the, one of the aspects I think that's somewhat unique of Aikido. And, um, that's certainly the thing you're trying to get to. So as you're practicing, whether you're the Nage or the UK, you're trying to get to the point where people can do the techniques on you fully and you're not going to get hurt. And that's, uh, really how you learn the techniques. Yeah, it is very different than other um, martial arts that I've studied um, because with some of the others, and I'm not going to name styles, but, and I've enjoyed every style I've studied. 
um, when you throw that, that back fist to break the nose, you don't break the nose. You stop short. So you never really feel the execution because you can't. You can't be doing that in the dojo all day long. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you, you can't, you can't, uh, you can't uh, hit each other in the nose. You know, that's right. But the I think if if both people are practicing correctly, if you do that some atemi, then you can do the atemi correctly, and they the UK moves enough so that you don't actually hit them. And and you don't, you're not trying to hit them. You're just going to a point in space, right, with the UK. Yeah. So if they it, it, and, and and maybe you make some adjustment, but basically. If the distance is right, you're not gonna you're gonna be able to do the atemi correctly and and still not hit them. But also, part of the atemi being correct is kind of like a a key thing in that if you do the atemi correctly, I think the UK feels it and they want you know they t- you know they change their movement slightly to avoid to avoid that even like further than maybe they would totally have to. But that goes to the more deeper concept of um, in the keto of um, I, uh, where the student learns that this energy is coming and, and here's the atemi and I'm moving out of the way and or I'm not moving out of the way and well I just learned a valuable lesson type of thing that in in other styles of or other martial arts that doesn't exist that way except in sparring um, when you're really practicing techniques you are not doing that and you're not developing that level of situational awareness. You're just allowing the other person to complete the technique. So in that respect too, Aikido is brilliant. It's brilliant. Uh, yeah, I, I think so. I think it's an amazing creation and uh, uh, the elements that are in it, I think are amazing. I mean, it, it's quite different from its precursors, you know, and, and, and in many ways. And, and so Osensei, I think really did, to transform martial arts in a certain way that in a very profound way. And, you know, sometimes I think of him as like the Picasso of martial arts, you know, like you had all this art in a classical tradition and then he took the art. And I don't know. I'm not an art historian, so I could, I could be totally wrong about this, but it seems to me that he really took the art in a completely different direction. And so opened up whole new areas of, of art because he, somehow creatively broke with tradition and went through all these different phases too. He was always working it, you know, it was changing. Anyway, I don't know anything about art, so I, I shouldn't be talking about that. But <laughs> I think Osensei, I think Osensei really did something amazing in the history of martial arts. Well, and, and when you talk about, but when you talk about also, I'm sorry, I, I go I ahead. Going. When you talk about, can I sensei always evolving as like an artist, um, always working on what his development would be with Aikido. I want to go to this, one of the last questions in this interview, because I find this so fascinating. Stanley asks, recently a certain person was explaining your Kodagash, and I noticed that it was very different from what I remembered your technique as being. I wonder if you would mind talking about your evolution in Aikido about changes in technique and in your way of thinking. Um, and can I sensei's answer was, uh, would you like me to read that? Or would you like to look at that? Uh, go on. Can I sensei says, it's difficult for me to say myself how my technique has changed. It's just a matter of spending a period of particular, a period on a particular technique and trying to delve a little more deeply into them one at a time. I feel sure that if I think about where on earth a particular movement came from on my own, then I will be able to recreate once more something exactly the same way as Osensei did at some stage in the past. Don't you think that if any person spends a certain period trying to research some particular thing, that he too must eventually have that same technique result? Anyway, this isn't how a person's technique evolves. It's only a matter of how a person who is learning something sees things in relation to the level of his own research. I can't say how I will change in the future. Yeah. That's great. That's very much who he was. And, and he was, I think he, he believed that Aikido was perfectly rational. And part of that rationality was analyzing the my 
analyzing the the techniques and the, the the physical principles the that underlay the techniques and uh, thinking about how the techniques could be better or different and yeah he that's what he was about um, it's interesting because um, I think that's what he did he would he would study techniques and try to delve more deeply into them and you know, and, 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 and so Osensei did something like that too, that, that he, cause Osensei was evolving the techniques. So it sounds like he thought that, uh, Osensei had, had, had come upon something that was supremely rational. And if you analyze the, the techniques or the Aikido very rationally, um, you would somehow follow in his path and, Oh, that's the aspect of applying your own, you know, you're applying your own understanding to all the things you've learned. See, I have, I, I tend to be very much, I just want to do the things I've learned, but inevitably you have to apply yourself like we're talking earlier to those, to those things. And, uh, and like I said, I keep, you know, Aikido and Budo and martial arts are supposed to be very practical and, so he's kind of saying that, that you, you're analyzing it um, and um, you, in that way, you, if, if you can delve deeper, then your technique changes. What's the extent to which this is uh, this, the notion of, uh, I think they call it uh, Shoshin or beginner's mind? Yeah. Is, is that part of this? Yeah. I mean, I think that... Uh, it is because it, it, beginner's mind is like, you, you know, you don't know anything. And so you're open to everything that comes. And if you start thinking, you know, something, then you stop analyzing it or you stop delving deeper because you think you know it. Right. And so if you can keep like the beginner's mind, this is the way I always interpret all the stuff about beginner's mind is you have to keep realizing that what you don't know is more significant than what you do know. Oh, that's excellent. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and, and don't be upset about that. No, don't be upset about that. Just fine. You're, because you're seeing, you're looking into something and seeing the reality. That's the reality. And if you think you, that the part you do understand is more significant than the part you don't understand, you're not really seeing reality. Or as I heard somebody else put it, <laughs> If you can't understand how anybody else could disagree with your position, perhaps you lack imagination. <laughs> <laughs> oh God. So, and, and this, this gets back to the whole, so this gets back really to the whole Budo of it, the whole idea of being Budo people, including of the beginner's mind. And yeah, but, uh, Budo, yeah, being a Budo person includes all that stuff. They have all these concepts. Right. And then can I sense saying, I can't say how I will change in the future because exactly. the future is what it's going to be. Right. So he's not saying, he, he's not saying, yes, I've, my technique has changed. And, you know, I think all of them, all those guys uh, uh, were very sensitive to the evolutionary aspect of Aikido and of their own techniques and of their own understanding. Um, I think they all shared that. And um um, so I think they always wanted to, uh, emphasize the, uh, the not, not static part of Aikido, the, the evolving part of Aikido and of themselves and how everybody was, everybody should be evolving all the time and the Aikido should be evolving all the time. So the Aikido is not done. It's like both, you know, it's both something you're trying to understand a whole body of knowledge, but at the same time, uh, it's not done. It's going to, it's going to evolve and I hope get better. It's like, like, like a bouillabaisse base that's uh, it's beautiful. It's in the pot, but it's always going to simmer. Yeah. You got to keep simmering. Got to keep the pot bubbling. Right. In, in the end of the interview, um, Stanley sort of, I think, provocatively said, look, there's some people that say that only Japanese can do Aikido. And Kanai Sensei says... Uh, yeah, this is, this, I, this is important because uh, this was a big thing. Um, 
uh, back in at that time, definitely that uh, there was a perception that, uh, or uh, there was a perception that some people had the perception that only Japanese could do Aikido. Probably it was more Japanese people to believe that, but <laughs> oh boy, uh, and and that was definitely around, and and I think even people in other countries like accepted that, you know, that, that, um, uh, you know, because they weren't Japanese, you know, they, they couldn't really do Aikido. And, uh, I think it was really a wrong idea. And so, uh, so when, when Stanley asked them, uh, certain people hold the view that only a Japanese person can do real Aikido sensei says that is absolutely not the case. And he told us that many times. There is no reason whatever for thinking such a foolish thing. It's just certain people who think like that. Um, yeah, it's really those... brought up about the, the language, the language of, you know, the Japanese language and w whether that's sort of the key to being able to do Aikido. Um, yeah, well, well, look, there's, there's aspects, since Aikido comes out of a Japanese culture, there's definitely parts of it that you can understand better by... Uh, understanding Japanese culture. But the core of it, which is, like he said earlier, the feeling you get when your instructor throws you, that doesn't require any language. No, no sensei, it does not. And in fact, that's why the Aikido is a universal thing. And that's one part of it. And O-sensei certainly stated that Aikido was a universal thing. And was not I uh, was not restricted to oh, restricted any group or any race or any country, and and I, that Aikido was a thing that everybody equally could um, participate in or 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 delve in. I don't know. I don't know what's the right word, but the 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 real Aikido anybody can can enter. What what strikes me as um, both telling and beautiful is uh, the end of the interview on these questions. Can I sensei says Aikido isn't a matter of words; it's one of kokuru, the mind or spirit. It is nothing but the confrontation of two feelings, two frames of mind, from out of which each partner tries to grasp something. Don't you agree? Question mark. He says, the confrontation of two human beings grasping that feeling is budo. It is Aikido. If you leave out this element, then I think this thing we call Aikido is impossible. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, That's all of it, right? That's the thing that you just talked about. It's like when your instructor throws you, you're getting something from, from, from that. When you work out with your, your partner, when you come to grips with the conflict together, you're really in any situation too, right? Yeah. That, that it's supposed to be, uh, you know, anytime you're interacting with some other person in a way, you're, um, it's some kind of, not necessarily confrontation, sometimes a confrontation, but it's some mixture of conflict and cooperation. And well, myself as a human being, every interaction I have with a human being <laughs> is a certain level of conflict. I know. That's why it's, it's kind of good that we all have to stay home and be quiet, you know? I know. I you know. don't have to deal with all these people. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. But uh, maybe, not... that's, maybe that's the silver lining. But, yeah. um, you know, it's the, so, yeah, it's a confrontation of two feelings, two frames of mind. I mean... It's out of which each partner tries to grasp something. Yeah. So whether you're, no matter what side you're on, you're trying to get something more out of the combination of you and the other person. So it's almost like everything in life offers us something. And that's what a keto is. Just saying, uh, there's something here. There's always something here to learn. There's something here to, to grasp. And from what I know of what Osensei, Osensei said and wrote, that thing is love. That the most universal thing, the most enlightened thing that we're supposed to try to find a way to grasp our way into from everything that happens is that. Yeah. Same as like all the greatest teachers in civilization have said the same thing. Well, at, well, least, in, at least in our, you know, culture, yeah. Western civilization. I think it's, 
you know, the Zen and the Taoism and Confucianism is probably slightly different, but I think it comes down to the same thing. Well, the, the Tao Te Ching by Lei Tzu, it's, it's the same thing. It's love. It's, it's, it's that, you know, that's an early writing, but that's the same thing. It's like it, it's coming down to the softness and pliability and water and, 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 you know, be water, which Bruce Lee talked about, but that came from the early 1400s, that uh, it's about that universal energy of love, I think. Well, it's, it's, that's everybody, everybody says that's the fundamental thing, yeah. And, and uh, Kai-sensei emphasizes that it's a process to get to that. So Of training hard. Well, so as if you're doing it through Aikido or through martial arts, then it's there. So it's, it's it, he says, it, it's moving from a state of confrontation to a state of non-confrontation. Yeah. And, uh, you know, in light of mm, some feeling or some, well, I'm obviously getting over my head with this thing, but yeah, love is, love is the basic thing. And the thing is, uh, how do you turn conflict into love or how do you work through the conflict to get to the love? Yeah. And that's what Aikido is about. Well, with that said, um, we really went through a lot of things today in this podcast. I, I, I feel blessed to have been a part of it, Sensei, and I thank you very, um, very... You didn't say anything that we're going to be embarrassed by, right? I don't know. <laughs> Possibly. <laughs> that to the audience to tell us. Um, but I, I think it's, we, it's bad when you think, you know, you can have these conversations and then somebody else is going to like be hearing it and saying, yeah, like, it's full of crap. <laughs> <laughs> I, for me, with the things that I say, I just call that like Wednesday. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Fine. Um, so uh, without further ado, I, I guess I will say uh, this has been Aikido Perspectives. Bum, with bum, bum, bum. <laughs> Chris Niskola was the theme. Um, I uh, have been your host, Ricky Berger, and joined by David Helper and Shihan, my sensei. And everyone, please stay safe, stay healthy. We love you, and till next time. Sensei, we like to say goodbye. Bye. <laughs> Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.